question and for posterity. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, um, thank you for being here for today's tea talk. Our uh, speaker is Katie Brady. She's at uh, Flatiron right now, uh, moving to CMU soon as a faculty. Uh, she did this one. Yes, <laughs> turning in uh, for faculty. Uh, she did her PhD at Northwestern uh, and she works on a lot of very interesting things uh, regarding compact binaries, uh, especially uh, population studies of double black holes, double neutron stars, double white dwarfs, uh, and she's going to tell us about Lisa, of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for letting me crash um, and give a tea talk on fairly short notice. Uh, so this is this is um, the slides are colloquium slides, so they're going to feel very formal, but it, this doesn't have to be formal if people have questions or whatever. The goal of this talk is really to, um, by the end of it, I want people to understand sort of like how Lisa maybe fits into different stellar uh, evolution studies um, and hopefully gets you as excited about Lisa as I am. Um, as motivation for this, so this is stellar origin. So as my motivation for this is um, binary stars are super important. And if you don't think that they're important in your science, um, I'm here until Thursday, through Thursday, and I would love to argue with you about why they are if you don't think that they are, because almost certainly binary stars play a very uh, important role in your science now, or they will soon. Um, some other motivation and reasons why I'm personally interested in compact binaries and stellar remnants are first, white dwarfs are the end state for basically every star by mass function um, estimates alone. Um, that means that we have now predicted something like tens of millions of double white dwarfs to exist in our galaxy. Um, that's just pretty obvious when you think about the fact that the galaxy has been forming stars for the past 10 giga years, and basically every star turns into a white dwarf. Um, if those stars are in binaries, they're gonna probably make double white dwarfs. Um, the rest of all of those star, uh, the rest of all the stars that are formed are going to form neutron stars and black holes. And we have predicted tens of hundreds of short period double compact objects as well to exist in our galaxy. Um, so what I am interested in studying is how we can use observations of stellar remnants and really just binary stars in general to study the outcomes of binary star interactions. And to give you a flavor of all the binary star interactions that I am personally interested in and excited about, um, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna walk you through sort of like a cartoony style evolution. Um, the reason, yeah, question. It's, it's informal. Yes, please. Not a relevant question. Do we know how many single white dwarfs there should be in the galaxy? Yeah, mm, basically the same number. Cause the, <laughs> cause binary fractions when you integrate over everything is roughly two out of every three stars are in binary. So but if there's- that fraction to be preserved. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, actually, no, that's an interesting. No, no, it's like 30, now I'm thinking on the fly, but I think like probably 30% of stars result, binaries result in mergers. So 50% start, 50, 50 starting out, and then maybe 30% of that 50%, which I'm not about to do fraction multiplication in my brain right now, but it's order of magnitude equal numbers, but tons of them. Um, yeah. I, yeah, sorry, I could go on like a thousand tangents off of that, but we're just going to leave it there. Good. Okay. So I'm going to kind of give you, I'm, I'm going through this evolution also to kind of give you a flavor of the way that I think about binary star interactions, because one thing that, uh, is very certain is that binary star interactions are extremely uncertain. And when we study them in greater and greater detail, they become more uncertain. <laughs> so um, we live in a, we bathe ourselves in uncertainty when we are studying binary stars. Um, okay, so this is a cartoony version of massive star evolution. You can tell it's massive star evolution because the time scale here says mega years. We'll talk about other time scales a little bit later on. Um, you can imagine this being two zero age mean sequence of stars in an orbit, a hundred days, a thousand days, kind of doesn't really matter. They're probably something like 15, 20 solar mass stars if they're gonna make black holes. 
Um, what happens here is the more massive star will exhaust the hydrogen in its envelope, exhaust all the fuel in its core, eventually evolve off the main sequence. And one thing that it can do when it builds its Roche lobe is go into something that we call stable mass transfer. This happens on um, thermal time scale, so like tens of thousands of years. And what ends up happening is that the more massive star will donate all of its mass in the envelope to its companion. That mass transfer can be completely conservative. It could be completely non-conservative. It's not actually well measured from data what the answer is there, but yeah, that's what it could be. Um, once that mass transfer is over, it leaves behind a very hot uh, stellar core or strip star. Um, you have a resident expert here in Ilva Goatberg, who's over at Carnegie. Ilva is the strip star queen. Um, very quickly after forming strip stars, it will uh, collapse down into a compact object, leaving behind a black hole. How this black hole forms? Very, very uncertain. Wildly open field of study, compact object formation. Do black holes form from supernova explosions or direct collapse? Maybe a combo of the two. We don't know for sure from theoretical predictions. This seems to be a highly stochastic process. Um, but one thing that we do know is that if the compact object formation uh, occurs from a, an asymmetric explosion, it will impart a natal kick into this binary, which will add eccentricity into the orbit of these types of stars. Okay, so now we have a black hole plus a bright star companion. Eventually that bright star is gonna evolve off the main sequence as well. It can go into a stable Roche overflow configuration, making a big giant X-ray binary, um, eventually donate its envelope to leave behind a strip star, have a black hole formation, um, maybe with a kick. And then from here on out, it just shrinks and circularizes due to the emission of gravitational waves. So this is one track. Um, at this branch here, you could go into a different phase. So if the mass transfer doesn't remain stable, it goes into something that we call a common envelope evolution. This is really wildly uncertain. We think it happens on dynamical time scales, so very, very short compared to the thermal time scale evolution of stable Roche overflow. Um, it also, so it happens faster and also tends to result in much tighter orbits than thermal uh, stable mass transfer. But once the strip star plus black hole is formed, you can again create a binary black hole, which merges slowly uh, due to the emission of gravitational waves. So that's like one channel. There are a couple of things to note. The first thing is the time scale. If you go through a common envelope, your merger times are usually much shorter because you form much closer binaries post common envelope. Um, actually, that's kind of both of these things go into that. Good. So this is one track. You can, of course, go down the other track all the way. So you could go through a common envelope down here and then a stable Roche overflow. We think this is probably relatively uncommon. Um, or in this way as well. So this is basically every way that from isolated binaries, you can make binary black hole merger. This does not encompass anything like triples, globular clusters, dynamics, anything like that. This is just isolated binary stars. Um, so this is really genuinely everything that I think about on a daily basis, if you add in the story of double white force and double neutron stars. But all I'm thinking about really is the outcomes of all of these different processes and put into words, first, Roche overflow mass transfer is really the dominant uncertainty in binary star interactions. And so understanding how binary stars evolve really relies on understanding how Roche overflow mass transfer works. What are the outcomes? Um, of when a star fills its Roche lobe. A secondary but very critical role in the formation of neutron stars and black holes is compact object kicks. If compact objects are formed with natal kicks and they are strong, you can unbind something like 90% of the binaries that you start out with. So that plays a really dramatic role on the types of uh, merging compact objects that we can observe. So I study both of these and many other types of physics using something called binary population synthesis, which basically takes single star evolution tracks that are calculated from algebraic fits to single star evolution codes, um, and then apply binary inter interaction physics at each time step 
in the evolution. And then just basically watch what happens <laughs> where you initialize a lot of population, uh, a lot of binary stars and run them through. The code that I use to do this is called COSMIC. Um, it's an acronym. It's like now not uh, in fashion to like name codes after acronyms I've learned, but COSMIC is an acronym. It's a really hard to Google acronym. So if you do want to Google it, don't just do COSMIC, do COSMIC pops in because um, COSMIC is a word that is used in many contexts. Uh, so COSMIC is, the thing that I want you to really pay attention to is that it's, it's openly developed and it's used, it's in Python. So we've documented if you want binary stars at any phase of evolution from zero age main sequence to compact object merger, COSMIC will make it for you in a very uncertain fashion with many, many flags, but you can go from nothing to 10,000 binaries in about 10 minutes. Um, and I've tested this quite a few times now. <laughs> so if you want to make binaries, uh, reach out. So far, COSMIC has been used in 63 studies where I'm kind of piggybacking on these globular cluster studies here where we have actually shoved COSMIC into the globular cluster code called CMC. Um, the thing that I want to highlight is we have a few studies now where folks are picking it up um, these are the studies in green. They're picking it up themselves and there aren't cosmic authors on it. So hopefully that motivates you to believe that people can really pick up the code and like use it. Um, today, I'm really just gonna talk about Lisa, but I'm here for a few days. So I'm super excited about binary black holes in general. Um, something that I won't talk about at all, but I'm really excited about is black holes with stellar companions, like the ones that were recently found in Gaia. Um, Something that's maybe a little bit less nerdy, but people are here maybe are excited about. Uh, did I say less? More nerdy. <laughs> survey selection function. I'm really into survey selection function. Um, and I'm uh, pretty uh, stoked also about open software development. So if that's something that you're interested in or feel um, weird about or whatever, I'm always excited to talk about that. Um, good. Okay, so that's kind of like my intro to the stellar origin part the way that I frame myself in uh, the context of the Lisa community. Now let's actually just talk about Lisa for a while. Um, so again, starting with a dramatic statement, Lisa will absolutely transform stellar evolution and stellar uh, science. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand why. Um, the roadmap for the next little while is we're gonna talk about what is going on with Lisa. Then we'll talk about how it fits into a multi-band narrative with double compact object sources, and then a multi-messenger narrative with Lisa and white dwarf binaries. Uh, good, okay, so what's the deal with Lisa? The plan launches, I have it as 2030s, it's like nebulous. It's pretty, things that are this big have nebulous start dates, um, but definitely 2030s feels safe, <laughs> I guess is what I would say. Um, the launch date, the last that I saw a year was 2035, but things can slip. Um, what I will say that's very important is that it, there is a launch date and it is going to happen and there is funding available for it. So even though 10 years and 15 years in the future sounds completely crazy, it's definitely going to happen. And there were a few years ago where Lisa was definitely not gonna happen. So we've kind of phase shifted into Lisa's definitely happening. Um, it's a very different kind of gravitational wave detector than the ones that are worked on here and on the ground. And that's because it is uh, enormous. So it's space-based and it has two and a half million kilometer long arms. Because of the detector size being so large, it's sensitive instead of um, orbits of a kilohertz, it's sensitive to millihertz or 90 minute to 20 second orbital periods. So that's a totally different frequency regime that we are dealing with. Um, the way that it works is it has test masses in each of these little spacecraft um, and those uh, lasers shoot between the spacecraft and measure stretches and squashes in space time. It doesn't actually measure um, the stretches and squashes, it measures phase changes, the buildup and the change in phase of the laser over time. Um, that's a whole other colloquium talk, like hours and hours of discussion. So we're not gonna go too deep into that, but the idea is there are test masses in each of these when you measure stretches and squashes in space time. One thing that's very useful with LISA is first, there are actually six 
laser links. So that means that there are two triangles, one on top of the other. And because that is the mission design, you can actually orient the, um, or not orient, but you can uh, study the time delay interferometry in this detector in a certain combination called the Sanyak channel that actually makes the detector completely insensitive to gravitational waves, which means that you can map your sensitivity of your detector once it launches basically perfectly. The other thing that's very cool is that it is in a cartwheeling orbit that trails the Earth that sort of sweeps out the entire sky. So it has a fairly um, good pointing directionality above about a millihertz. So it has like arc second precision at like 10 kilohertz. Okay, so that's Lisa. It Instead of being like a light collector or a light bucket collector, what, what is that word? I don't know. Instead of being a light bucket, it just measures stretches and squashes. So this is how we determine whether a source is detected or not. Um, the x-axis is gravitational wave frequency. For circular orbits, that's just two times the orbital frequency. So it gives you a really direct um, dynamical measure, the orbit. On the y-axis is something called the amplitude spectral density. And that's basically what the strength of the stretch and squash is built up over time, over observation time. The shape of the curve is actually really easy to understand. At low frequencies, uh, the curve goes up because it is difficult to measure the position of the test masses over very long periods of time. So that curve goes up. The noise floor is how well you can keep those test masses isolated. And then at higher frequencies, your sensitivity actually degrades because the size of the gravitational wave is smaller than the size of the detector. And you can see the effect beat on harmonics of the size of the detector, which is kind of cool. Okay, so this is our frequency band, the millihertz band. Um, it is like positively stacked with astrophysics. Lisa will be an astrophysical observatory. It will not be a physics experiment. <laughs> like that's, if you leave with anything, leave with that notion. Um, Lisa will be sensitive to literally anything that orbits between 90 minutes and 20 seconds. And it turns out our universe is filled with things that do that. Um, the flagship source is massive black hole binaries uh, that merge in the centers of galaxies. If these things merge basically anywhere in the universe with masses greater than 10 to the six solar masses, Lisa will observe them. Like just no questions asked. That's crazy. Every single one just picks it up, sweeps it up. Um, a little bit closer by, Lisa will observe these kinds of signals here. These are called extreme mass ratio in spirals and that is stellar mass objects mapping out the space time around supermassive uh, objects until they eventually fall in. And by far the most numerous source are the stellar uh, mass objects, just binary stellar mass objects. That's all these purple guys. These are what we call verification binaries because we've seen them with telescopes. We know that they exist. And then here are binaries that got added after 2016. Um, these are they called them LIGO type black holes because that's what we observe them as. But we realized pretty rapidly after GOE 150914 was detected that if you wind it back into Lisa, Lisa probably would have been able to observe it. So this will come back later. Okay, so as I've been saying, close double stellar remnants are actually really excellent gravitational wave sources. Um, they're really easy to calculate the gravitational wave uh, strength because they orbit where the quadruple regime is fair game. They're not really doing any crazy GR things. They're just shrinking due to the emission of gravitational waves. And so this is the very simple uh, parameterization that you can take to decide whether something is detectable by Lisa. Um, as I said, there are tons of double white dwarfs out there. Probably Lisa will observe many of them. So where do those observations actually stand? There are something like 160 double white dwarfs from 10 to the five white dwarf candidates. This number is like really lopsided and there are a few reasons why. Um, there are some surveys that have been doing all of this work to find those double white dwarfs. One of the early ones is the ELM survey that was led by Warren Brown. They turned out about a hundred double white dwarfs and the way that they've found them is actually using 
um, astrophysics and not survey strategies that specifically look for binaries. They use the fact that the mass of an Elm white dwarf or extremely low mass white dwarf is less than the mass of a white dwarf that would be able to form in the age of the galaxy as a single star. So by virtue of being low mass, they definitely are in binary. So that's like the idea. So they select on white dwarfs that have this mass based on a color color plot, and then they follow them up with radio velocities and their survey basically has 100% success rate. So the elm white dwarfs are in binaries and that was a really good way to find binary white dwarfs because we knew that they probably formed through interactions. Unfortunately, these are not very representative of all of the white dwarfs in the galaxy. So it's a very complete and easy to map survey that's also very biased towards a certain type of source. There are other radial velocity surveys like Swarms and SPY. Um, they have turned out a few dozen as well. And here they're just literally looking for radial velocity shifts in white dwarf candidate data. This is a way hard job. You're just drilling on white dwarfs and white dwarf spectra, as you can see, are very not feature full. So it's pretty hard to get those radial velocity shifts. And then finally, something that many of you will probably be very familiar with here, uh, ZTF has been just churning out double white dwarfs left and right. The reason for this is not um, due, is due to no small feet because they're looking where the white dwarfs are. So when I started my PhD in 2013, there was a huge question of whether we weren't finding double white dwarfs because they didn't exist or because we weren't looking in the right places. And ZTF has shown handily that you just weren't looking in the right places. If you look in the disk, you find tons of double white dwarfs. It's just really, really, really hard to do that. And so the amount of work that goes into pulling out these short period double white dwarfs from the photometric surveys is just like unpar. It's such a difficult search strategy. So it's not surprising that people didn't want to do it, but ZTF has really, really, really shown that it's valuable to get down into the disk if you really want to find these things. Um, so the punchline here is photometric surveys definitely are finding the double white dwarfs, but it's extremely, extremely hard. They're dim. They don't have a lot of features in their spectra. If you're looking for short period signals, photometric time series, that's a huge computational problem. Um, but as a theorist, I very much appreciate all of the work that's going into this. <laughs> um, so if you find double white dwarfs and you want to tell whether or not they're detectable in LISA, we've recently released a tool, myself and Tom Wyeth, who's now at um, UW Seattle. Um, if you find a source that has an orbital period less than an hour, any source, it's probably worth checking it into legwork just to see if it has a detectable SNR. People are finding things that uh, are detectable that we didn't really, we weren't really sure. So like SDB binaries, any strip binaries, anything that has an orbital period less than an hour, it might be worth just checking in. It's very, very easy to use. When you do this with a known double white dwarf, you can put them on a LISA sensitivity curve. And these are effectively what we call the verification binary. So we know where they are, we know what their inclinations are, we know what their masses are, we can just check them on this curve. And now we know where to look when we supplies. So that's fun, that's cool. This is not 10 million <laughs> sources. So what actually will Lisa see when there are 10 million double white dwarfs radiating? Um, to do that, I kind of like to actually go through another cartoony thing. So there are, I like to think of Lisa as kind of like this set of, buckets and frequency that you can put binaries into. Um, and it's kind of like, I don't know if people watch the prices, right? But it's kind of like Plinko, <laughs> where like you drop your double doors in the top and then Lisa sorts them into the um, frequency bin that they're orbiting with. But the idea here is that the lowest frequency binaries are the widest binaries. You add them all in in, uh, in the time series that Lisa takes. And what you end up finding is first, that there are way, way, way more wide binaries than short binaries. And that has to do with a very simple relation that is the fact that gravitational wave emission uh, acts with a very high power in gravitational wave frequency. So the lower in frequency are, you are, the slower you evolve. That means the binaries down here evolve 2 million times slower than binaries up here. So really you get a massive pileup. Uh, this is compounded 
with the fact that Lisa's time sampling is linear in time. So Lisa's frequency sensitivity is about one part in 10 to the eight hertz. That means that of the millions of binaries down here that you have, you also have a hundred fewer bins to put them in. So all of these guys down here are radiating gravitational waves over the top of each other a lot. That's a very confused signal while everything up here is radiating in its own lovely little frequency bin. When you actually do this and count up the power from say a galaxy that's simulated, this is actually what the LISA amplitude spectrum density looks like. Um, there are some features that I wanna highlight. The first one is an artificial feature. So many studies uh, pull out any interacting double white dwarfs because what happens when double white dwarfs fill the Roche lobe is very uncertain and you have to treat it um, in a specific way. <laughs> And we don't really exactly know how that all works, but people like myself and Kyle and others um, have thought about that. But in the large population studies, we just rip them out because we don't think that they contribute very strongly to the rest of the gravitational wave foreground. So that's the first thing. The next thing is this feature that kind of hangs out right around here. So below here, you can see that there's this floor and the power, that's an astrophysical noise floor that no matter how powerful Lisa is, you will run into this. You will have to figure out how to subtract out that power or it's just your noise floor and there's nothing you can do about it. Up here, you can see that, that uh, the effect of this the number of double white dwarfs per bin going to zero because what I'm plotting is literally a power spectrum. So the lines are going up and down and up and down and up and down because the power going up and down and up and down. Whereas over here, you can just see that it's full all the way up. Um, and as I said, there's something like 10,000 binaries here and about 10 million binaries down there. So when people in the LISA community talk about resolved binaries and there being tens of thousands of resolved binaries, that's these guys. And this is the unresolved foreground below. Cool. Okay. So that's what the galaxy looks like in LISA. Um, there are, there's another way that I like to think about LISA and that's in terms of its survey selection. So what you can do is instead of showing amplitude spectral density versus frequency, you can show the chirp mass versus frequency and then how far LISA will be able to resolve sources out to with a signal to noise greater than seven. So this is our, you can kind of see pictures of the LISA sensitivity curve in there and that horizon distance a little bit. Um, there are some lines that I can put on to help with uh, orienting. So the Milky Way Center is really low on here. SMC and LMC, Andromeda, 17.0817. There's another interesting feature, which is here. You can actually see that at certain frequencies, binaries just chirp out of the LISA band completely, and that frequency actually decreases pretty significantly by the time you get to binary black hole masses. So those are where the masses are here. So this is basically Lisa's sensitivity all on one figure, like Lisa's survey selection sensitivity. Um, I'll write, I'll just write down actually what the words are here. So Lisa will provide a complete census of every single double wave dwarf, as long as its orbital period gives it a gravitational wave, or its orbital frequency is above three millihertz. Um, for double neutron stars, that decreases because the mass goes up. And for binary black holes, that decreases quite a bit as well. Um, so that's cool. Complete survey, just totally complete. We don't even have to think about observation cadence or anything like that, which is really, really nice. Everything else, is very, very well understood because the gravitational waves that are emitted don't interact with anything. So you can really just read off if Lisa found a source where it was. If it didn't see a source, you know exactly why it didn't see it. <laughs> um, and this is why I personally have worked a lot with gravitational waves and binary populations because mapping that survey selection is very easy. Uh, good, okay, so 
there is another thing that I want to cover very quickly, which is the source parameters that Lisa measures very critically depends on whether you measure a chirp. So Lisa measures this strain here. The strain, uh, when Lisa measures the source, it measures the gravitational wave frequency because that's what it's, me it's measuring of amplitude and a frequency. But there is this very annoying degeneracy in the chirp mass and distance that is only solved if you measure a chirp. So if you measure the chirp evolution due to gravitational waves, you can calculate the chirp mass, stick that back in, solve for the distance. This is super, super critical for, um, for really getting precision measurements from gravitational sources. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the multi-messenger section. So punchline. If you're interested in stellar sources, Lisa is going to clean up on stellar remnant sources and will tell you the relative rates and properties of those sources in the galaxy. Good. Okay, now we can talk about some science cases. I feel like I've given them a, like a classroom lecture basically so far. Yeah, go ahead. So when you say that, you know, for the compute sensors of like yours, uh, how long is that going to be? Because you say like, well, these are turns out. Four years of observation duration. So by the end of it, like, is it going to be like yeah, building up, or like you have to wait to the very end and you know anything? There That's no, weird. there are planned uh, data releases. There will be like data releases, kind of like Gaia, and so within um, six months, you should see the loudest thousand double white dwarfs. Easy, like they'll stick out really fast. They're also very easy to model because they're basically sinusoids. What sets the time scale? What sets the time scale? Oh, the um, basically like the observation duration. So this right here, this height is the strain times the square root of the observation time for sources that are evolving slowly. And all of the double white force are evolving slowly. Yeah. Yeah. For the supermassive black holes, different story. <laughs> it's completely different story. Yeah. Other, yeah, for yeah. the binary white is um, emitting a three megahertz. Like, how many cycles do you have to do to detect the chirp? Oh, that's not many. So, Lisa's chirp sensitivity is, let's see. So, I said it's like one part into the minus eight. Lisa's chirp sensitivity is this frequency bandwidth per year. That's like a good rule of thumb. And so for the interesting thing is that when you put that on this curve, it's also basically about three millihertz is where you get to that most double white works are chirping at that rate. It should be better than this. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. assume that it moves between bins and you yep. should be able to detect frequency evolution even if it doesn't move between bins. Yeah. That's so you can as a in the order of mass, yeah, yeah, order of mass. Yeah, that's that, yeah. So it's like a good rule of thumb to actually pull out what is observable and what is not observable. The fun and annoying thing about Lisa uh, is that you have to analyze the whole population <laughs> to decide what is and isn't resolvable. So we, um, in the years before Lisa launches, we do a lot of rule of thumb things because it's very expensive to run a Lisa pipeline over all of this. Um, one of the leading experts in this, Tyson Lindenberg, does this. Um, he's at Marshall. And the last global fit that he ran with all of the sources in it cost $50,000 on AWS. And so he was like, maybe I will hire a postdoc next time instead of running the global fit on like, so yeah, it's a pretty, it's an expensive uh, fee right now. Yeah. So as the orbit is decaying, the phase lag goes into Times Square. So, won't the sensitive due to the chirp code your observing time square you get a lot better? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's I think that that's right. So that's yeah, so so we um we were actually doing a study a few months ago about optimal observing strategies for all the different science cases, and we gave the most like ridiculous optimal observing strategy for the white dwarfs because it's literally turn on for a month and then turn off for a year <laughs> and then turn on for a month and turn off for a year because we build up so much signal that if you were to able to do that we would be able to measure chirp all the way down here 
Um, but that's not optimal for literally any other science case. So we mostly got laughed at by writing that in a document. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's fun. Cool. And so why do you want to turn off the net? strategy just to conserve yeah to literally like conserve power yeah and just you just want it to run for as long as possible yeah. is the idea like if you could so launch it with enough fuel. yeah huh the fuel so it actually doesn't work very well okay. yeah actually, I, I thought it was the orbit uh, changing that actually really runs yeah oh yeah so it's the fuel to keep it on the orbit yeah okay. yeah yeah that's the primary yeah. Yeah. If there wasn't like solar radiation pressure, then we could run Lisa for a lot longer. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, I don't know. Solar radiation pressure does anything for like the habitable nest of the earth. But yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I always talk to long all right so good let's say this okay so let's talk about multi-band sources and then we'll talk about lisa white dwarf binaries um all right so for multi-band sources to be multi-band you have to have another band in this case for the lisa stellar mass sources it's ground-based detectors that we're being multi-band with um i don't need to spend a lot of time on this we have detected gravitational waves we have detected a lot of gravitational waves um these are some of the statements that have been made in LIGO papers. They're not um, particularly like strong statements about formation channels. And the reason for that is because with every detection that has been made, the theorists have gone rampant and come up with ways to make every single kind of detection. Um, binary black holes could originate from like tons and tons of different environments, but they can sort of be divided into binaries that are put together by things outside of the binary or dynamically formed versus binaries that are born as binaries and stay as binaries. This includes um, kind of wacky things like primordial black holes even. Those are technically, they're formed in isolation, do whatever. The thing that matters for Lisa is that basically every source that goes into these ground-based detectors will pass through the millihertz band. And the only thing that stops you from being observed by Lisa is if you are close enough in that horizon distance plot that I showed you to be picked up. What that means is that we can actually just do data-driven approaches that say, let's take all of the binaries that, observe, that we have observed in the kilohertz band and wind them back into LISA to see what we could see. And it turns out that something like four to 140 sources might actually be observed here and traverse into the LIGO band and merge during the LISA observation time, which is kind of cool. This was very exciting. Um, Alberto Sazana wrote this paper, uh, very deserving of a PRL back in 2016, very quickly after um, GW 150914 was reported. Um, there are, of course, more sources that might just be at lower frequencies that don't technically traverse out of the band. Those are also still exciting. Um, if you do a forward model from population synthesis, we get kind of roughly similar results. So we're not off by like many, many orders of magnitude, but this zero is doing a lot of heavy work <laughs> on the lower end of the uncertainties there. So, um, but the punchline is that multi-band science is like, Definitely on the table. Yeah, go ahead. Two, two questions. Isn't this consistency just saying that population synthesis has been tuned to LIGO detections? To, to produce the LIGO Probably, yeah. So there, but what I will say is these guys are pre-LIGO and they do kind of upper bound up here. So the, these ones, let's see, where is, well, there's like a gazillion. These are actually just Lisa predictions, but there have never really been super high Lisa predictions. Um, yeah. May I have one more question? Yeah. I agree. I agree. Your previous slide, are there any sources that could potentially form between the Lisa and Lego band in the Desi Bears region? The, so what can form there, and actually let me, I'm just gonna show this next. 
So most of the sources that form, and so here, this is a this is kind of a crazy figure. There's a lot going on. Um, this is eccentricity versus gravitational wave frequency. Every line is a binary that formed in either a globular cluster or an isolated binary. And it forms here and then shrinks and circularizes. On this figure, we just, the gravitational wave frequency that we plot here is just two times the orbital frequency. But when your eccentricity is huge up here, it actually might be radiating in the decibers band because the gravitational wave emission is spread out over many harmonics. Um, so, so that statement that you made is true, but there are actually no formation channels that I know of, except for literally direct head-on collisions that would form a gravitational wave source in the decahertz band with orbital frequency. <laughs> but with gravitational wave frequency, things get a little bit hazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's this figure. There are other colors on here. So this one, this is just the Lisa band. This is where you can guarantee a chirp measurement for any massive black hole. And the reason that we delineate this here is because one way that you can measure eccentricity is actually just measuring the chirp to be consistent with an eccentric orbit. That's a really slam dunk way to show eccentricity, just that the chirp is consistent with um, an eccentric orbit. When you do that, uh, these papers here, Nishizawa 16 and 17, showed that 100% of the time, binaries with a Fisher matrix uh, injection recovered an eccentricity of 0.01, and 90% of the time, they recovered an eccentricity measurement here. So Lisa will measure kind of like lots of eccentric binaries. Um, the thing that's cool is that because we restricted to here, they also measure chirp masses as well. And basically, every channel kind of predicts different chirp mass and eccentricity distributions. So that means that Lisa will more or less read off where uh, the binary black holes that it observes are being formed, if they're being formed dynamically or in isolation. Sorry, what are those different colors? These are, so that's globular clusters. And then these are uh, single common envelope versus double common envelope. There are like very few of these where the binaries, they just form just wide enough to not interact. And it's like, we allow them to run for 13.7 giga here. So these are probably pretty low likelihood, but could be out there. So should I interpret this as if you haven't been very common and look, it's got higher mass for each reaction to take Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and you're very circular because there are no kicks or anything. Like you really had to have a low kick to not be unbound and to make your um, yeah radiation reaction time. Yeah. So that's cool. If we wait 10 years, Lisa will tell us where the binary black holes come from. People will probably try to figure out a lot more in the meantime. Um, a similar story can actually be said uh, with another discrepancy, which is the BNS merger rate that's observed by ground-based gravitational wave detectors is about six times higher than the observed rate from radio surveys of double neutron stars in the galaxy. So this is like a pretty solid discrepancy that seems a little weird. Um, a paper that Jeff Andrews and I came up with a couple of years ago uh, relies on this idea that maybe a fast merging binary neutron star channel could exist that actually forms binaries at very short periods that are actually invisible to radio surveys. So the idea here, this is like a period versus spin period plot. And if you just plunk a neutron star binary on here, what you see is that there's this degradation factor that they apply in this community. And if you're below short periods, the degradation factor really tanks most of the short period binaries. So if you're a, a double neutron star with an orbital period less than a day, you're virtually invisible to radio surveys. And that's because the orbit spreads out um, signal, smears it out. So we had the thought, ah, th well, an hour is pretty great for this other detector called LISA. Um, and so we looked into uh, combining the fact that Lisa can observe things in an hour orbital period, as well as the fact that Lisa can observe eccentricities 
at these periods. And so we took um, the known double neutron stars here and we evolved them forward through the Lisa band. Um, we were really motivated by the fact that the known double neutron stars have these two eccentricity distributions. And actually, if you trace the orbital evolution of a couple of these, they look like they're ejected from a globular cluster. So like, really, it seems like nature is kind of like hitting us in the face with this idea of a isolated versus dynamical formation channel. And now if you put a fast merging channel that comes from isolated binaries, and then you put it on the Lisa curve in black here, you see lots of not very eccentric sources. Whereas if you put a fast merging dynamical channel, there's tons and tons of eccentric Lisa sources. And this actually works quite well with some of the predicted um, models. So Thomas Taurus's favorite uh, case BV mass transfer, which is this really, really, it produces really, really tight double neutron star binaries fits right in here. And then globular cluster models like those produced by Claire Yee um, fit in here. So by the time Lisa flies, we should really just be able to read off whether we're missing a bunch of dynamically produced systems or whether case BB mass transfer is actually what's doing this. Maybe it's something else, but nonetheless, we'll be able to tell whether it's isolated and not eccentric or dynamical and very eccentric. What are roughly the relative rates from those two? Channels? Yeah, so right now this the rates are much higher for case BB mass transfer than from Claire's models. Claire's model, Claire has really- I mean from just like the observed systems there. We, uh, yes, and it's like, oh no, we calculated it. We calculated it empirically from uh, just winding the LIGO rates back, and it's like 150, I think, something like that. Can't remember exactly. So, where are those orbital periods in this BB scenario? Because like I know the papers pretty well. It's mostly evolving binaries that are periods of a few hours to days. Yeah. But you're circling binaries of periods of less. Like than point one, hour. one days? Yeah. That's not less than that, is it? A tenth of a day? Yeah, so two hours. Like an hour. Most yeah. of the most of those papers are about binaries of several hours or several days. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh that, that's I think we just put up well, so some models that are down there, but I'm not sure yeah, get them. Yeah, we put so this was more empirically defined by the radio limits. What so we, we oh. just the idea that below about the, okay, yeah. So so just assuming something just formed. something like this, yeah. So really those periods are just the periods that you wouldn't have That you have, yeah, that we haven't seen, exactly. So Lisa will, the, I guess the way that, and the way that we really framed it in the paper was very empirically driven rather than forward model. Then the rates, then we have no idea about the rates. Right. For, oh, for these guys. Yeah. Yeah, well, so no, so what we said for the rates is we actually count the LIGO rate and say that they're all coming from here or they're all coming from here. Yeah. But have people done the, because you could take these observed populations and forward model those to get rates as opposed to from the LIGO rates. I don't think anyone has done that for this, except for your 2019. Like, I'm wondering, like, based on those four, those four systems up there. Yeah. Could you take those and forward? People haven't taken those four systems and, and, and for what the merger rate yeah, like yeah, we have, yeah, and that's that's where you get from these systems alone. That's where you get the six so times discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, yeah. So I'll just say another thing. Samantha and I had a paper in the last year, I think, where we talked more about this case of PV mass transfer yeah. or, or even later phase mass transfer. And talk about how it might end up going unstable. So you might actually have a common envelope then like that, 10 years before the supernova or something. Does that yeah. lead to a merger? Uh, so we calculated what the orbital period would be after that, and it can be very short. Ah, like, so it's like another way down here. Good. So that's a way better 
Well, it's, to it's this related to basically <laughs> that too, but if you just yeah. involve the binary further in time, yeah. the mass transfer can go unstable and then it can it. In orbit from several days. Cool. So down to hours or less or even minutes. So and that does that happen because of the orbital evolution that drives because them close the stars, together? Maybe. Or because yeah. the star changes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Lives. Cool. So it might drive some of those systems unstable. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Would you do you think no, never mind. Okay. We should maybe we should talk about this more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's super interesting. Yeah. Um cool. Good. Okay. I have like very little time, which is good because we're chatting. So punchlines. Lisa will really help unveil this, these formation environments. Eccentricity measurement is like a huge game changer in this field because it's pretty much unaccessible at high frequencies. And Lisa is low frequency. For the white dwarfs, um, as I said, Lisa's primary source will be white dwarfs and it will be complete below 700 seconds. One of our flagship binary science cases here is just sort of mapping what happens to all these white dwarfs as a function of mass. This is something that we love to talk about. Lisa will just tell us what all the white dwarfs are doing. Um, but even if we measure the distance with the frequency here, or f dot, we only measure chirp mass. So Lisa will not do precision measurements on these guys for the majority of the population unless we have EM observations. And so Lisa's science case is really intimately tied to EM observations. And that means that any EM observations that we get before Lisa launches are going to play a massively critical role in all of the precision, precision, well, precision science that we're trying to do that's mapping these kinds of things out. Um, is, is measuring higher order frequency evolution terms on the chart? It's not out of the picture, but it's a really small fraction. So it's like one to two percent of the resolved white dwarfs that actually have f double dots that are measurable enough. Well, not f double dots; it will be crashed to f dot. So the one, sorry. Yeah, I think that that's basically an f double dot, right? No, it will be f dot with the lower f double dot. The one can crash to f dot. So it does not. Uh, has, yeah. And it's should be lower than that. That's like two p m one p m one. In Japan, you're direction. saying one. Yeah. Okay. I think so. My understanding of the literature has basically been that that is out of the question, except for sources that are eccentric, because that. Um, you see like precession or like interesting things in the F dot for really eccentric sources or sources that have like um, uh, tides playing a role in very eccentric orbits. But that is so far what I've seen, it literally is like one to 2% of the population. I It would be interesting though to have, one thing that would be helpful for the big population studies that I do is like a term that we can check in to say this fraction could be observed with a 1 p.m. So that's maybe we should talk more about what that looks like because um, that would play a huge role because the white dwarfs that we can see with telescopes are very close and not complete out <laughs> to um, the rest of the galaxy. Um, another thing that's ver very valuable uh, that Sweda Shah showed a few years ago is that if you know where a binary is, that helps you by a factor of two in your parameter estimation. And more importantly, if you know what the inclination of the binary is, it can help to up to a factor of 40. Um, so EM observations really play a huge role in LISA um, parameter estimation. And I think we don't do a good enough job in art in the LISA community of saying that because <laughs> it's real, like it's really critical. If we're, if we're gonna make this figure and put rates on it, like it's not gonna happen for the majority of the population. I guess, so yeah. Maybe I'm reading into the figure too much, but the Lisa will fill in the the spikes and the scatter points of this figure. Yeah. And but, it should give a we don't really know, map. but these boundaries are still uncertain. We don't it won't really tell us. It'll tell us the outcomes as so far as we believe the 
It will, yeah. so it'll put, what it will do is make a heat map of all of these sources that we can then compare to the real rates rates of, of all of these yeah. observations. Yeah. So testing this uh, will be done with a second heat map. <laughs> the messy, yeah. Okay, the other very, very quickly want to get on um, is this. So for the accre accreting white dwarfs, it's actually much even more critical that we get distance measurements, because for accreting sources, Lisa measures this F dot total, and in the accreting sources, there's a lot of physics going on. And if Lisa just measures F dot total, our distance measurement will be wrong because we relied on it being F dot GR, and we lose out on all of this physics. So EM distance measurements that plunk this D down here will give us chirp mass measurements, and then we can actually split this all out into something like this, which is the f dot gr that we can calculate versus f dot astro. So again, EM observations, critical, like really, really critical for doing most of the flagship Lisa science. Um, so is this, yeah. the, way, the way to apply it here is how like your orders of magnitude of the gr value. So if you assume this gr evolution, you would get a chart mass of uh, Mass, uh, uh, you get some, you get an unphysical chirp mass because the f dot is negative. <laughs> and so why you did no, you wouldn't. You know it's weird. weird. Yeah, you know that they're weird, yeah. but you wouldn't be able to measure anything unless you have a measured distance by some other way. So like you'd be biased. You would know that those binaries there's something else coming. It. Not necessarily because of time scales here. So this is this is an evolution as a function of time. The point where it's very, very negative is really small by comparison. So out here, you'll be biased. But the other way to see it is here. So the closer together they get, the more likely you are to be biased. Yeah. And the nice thing, one thing that's valuable is that the distance here actually isn't really biased in the same way. So we should, in practice, be able to see all of these tracks filled out um, because the distance is just photometric versus what's going on in the orbit. Yeah. Cool. Okay, we're at five, so I'm just gonna leave this here. Lisa will provide a really, really fantastic census of binaries, but really to do science, like a lot of the science that we're saying that we're going to do, this EM precision science is like totally like a huge linchpin that um, we should continue to prioritize. And that's what I will stop with because we are at time and I don't want people to be stuck here after five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those data source is a double white source. So how how long does it take to merger? Those take a, a really long time. So so like if I go back to but you you can't say which of them become F one A or like something like that. Yeah, so we will we will probably not observe anything like going into type 1a right because like that's down here <laughs> like these are really a low fraction what we will be able to say though is the rate of double white dwarfs with chirp masses that have enough mass in the binary to go type 1a and how many of them are here and since there's not really a lot of physics that's going on between this frequency and this frequency you can make that mapping pretty easily uh -huh. Yeah, there's some uncertainty in tides, but if the white dwarfs are already synchronized because they're circular, then maybe that's not such a big question. Yeah. So you can pretty precisely get the merger rate. Yeah, for sure. And as a function of chirp mass, for the ones that we get eclipsers with, then you can do it as a function of the M1, M2. Yeah. Well, you can get the merger rate from the other galaxy in this. That's right. That's right. Because yeah, outside of the galaxy, 
we're really not. We're we're really pushing it. <laughs> like we might see one very lucky big double white dwarf in Andromeda, which would be kind of fun. That'd be like a really we fun weird uh, distance measurement to Andromeda. <laughs> <laughs> So what will you be working on till 2037? Till 2037. If you did drop tomorrow, what's the kind of thing you would yeah. say, oh, should it have 10 years? So the thing, years. yeah, well, the thing, the thing that I'm, so the thing I'm looking at right now is actually this, and I had no time to get to it. I think that there's a lot of work to be done in the CDs. So this is, we just, this is a paper that we're writing right now. We've taken um, data, from Anna Paolo's 2020 CV paper, cataclysmic variables are these white dwarfs that are accreting hydrogen rich material. And we have a pretty complete sample up to 150 parsecs. Um, the reason that, that that 150 parsecs is so close is because there are pretty wide orbital periods and their donor masses are tiny. So the chirp masses are really small. So your volume is really like close. Um, but it turns out that there's a lot. There are a lot of CVs locally, um, and we think of quite a few of them will be resolved. So what I'm showing in like this histogram is a bunch of realizations where we've simulated based on the observed sample and just redistribute them. Um, this is what we think Lisa will see. And the cool thing is that when you actually shove this through, uh, so the gray points are just a little bit more distant. Yeah, the gray points are out to a okay. kiloparsec. Okay. Those yeah. are below the nucleus. Yeah, exactly. So like this is within a, the black dots are the 150 parsec sample. So you can see it's out to about 300 parsecs that they might be resolvable. Um, where I lost this. There we go. Yeah, so there's like a ton of CVs. So I think the thing that I want to think a lot about is what we can do here, because Lisa will measure, we think, a pretty obvious CV bump in the power spectrum. <laughs> like We're kind of surprised no one has really been like talking about it, because we've known about CVs since like the 70s, and we've known that there are tons of them since like the 70s. Um, but yeah, thinking about, I'm, I'm really interested in trying to figure out what we can learn about CVs based on what this power spectrum bump is doing. So we, yeah. we would be able to measure the period mean. Yeah, so this is the period bounce, the period minimum. <laughs> it's like, it's just like this massive vertical spike. <laughs> um, so that's kind of fun. But the problem is that down here, these are probably not um, observable chirps. So we're gonna have to get really clever about how we pick them out. Um, but yeah. yeah but the shape of that, Exactly. Cool. It tells you how fast they move, like through. It's, it's very yeah. So we're pretty stoked about um, prospects here, but it's very. This is very NASA. Like we've literally just taken data and redistributed it, it in the galaxy, and then shoved it onto the power spectrum. So I think there's a lot to be done here. Yeah. Yeah, but Peter got this too too far away. Yeah. No, no, that's like, this is like, wait, we can tell. Well, we have to do division in our head, but this is the period. <laughs> so we actually fill in the period gap with Lisa sources. Um, but you can, you can, detect but you can see that. it. Yeah, you can see the this, sources. The question is, did it exist or not, right? Yeah, so, yeah, we know, we know that it exists with the sort of like, yeah. But Lisa should be able to observe I guess that's. But it shouldn't exist in Lisa. Yeah, no, so there's no, it, right. So this is the period gap in Lisa. And then that's the period bump. So Lisa doesn't have a period gap. Yeah. It's just, yeah. So there, are, there should be sources there that are just not on last transfer. Yeah. 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 So that's one thing that you could do is just say, Lisa will tell you how many sources are in the period gap, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of um, science cases like this that are just like hanging out in EM land that people just haven't scooped up yet because the two communities don't talk to each other very often. Um, and the CV community in particular is quite small. So overlaps are harder to come by.
but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah time has free been. free years. Yeah, 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 and so on. Yeah, let's thank you. 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 Thank you.